question. But uh, I went to college at MIT and back in the 1970s, and MIT had a Tiffany's team, and I was on the Tiffany's team that I had at MIT, um, and that, that led to my uh, becoming the official historian of the North American Tiffany's Association. So I, I thought as part of my duties, I should research what was the origin of the game of Tiffany's. By that time, I was uh, I graduated college. I was in law school at uh, Harvard. And uh, I was the most uh, indifferent law student ever at Harvard, uh, it's safe to say. So I, I didn't really go to classes very much. Instead, <laughs> I haunted the stacks of Wider Library, the great library at Harvard. And I was trying to find the, uh, the origin of the game of two minutes. And I, I discovered they had a great collection in the basement of uh, old books on sports and games. Uh, and so I looked for. for uh, evidence of early evidence of Tiffany's. And I also looked up on the upstairs in the wider library in the reference room, and there was this big set of books, of 20 huge books in Oxford English Dictionary. And, and I looked there in other dictionaries for the word Tiffany's. And I saw the Oxford English Dictionary, they seemed to attempt to give the earliest usage, the earliest printed usage of every, every word and every phrase sense of every word. And they, for two links, the game, they gave 1894 as their earliest usage. And I was puzzled because I had, in my, when I was down in the basement, I had discovered this 1890 uh, Encyclopedia of Sports and Games, which had a whole article <coughs> Software that I got a lot of uh, publicity 
in, in teddy bears. Uh, but I also, just to relate this to law, I also uh, try to get today groups in law and uh, if the guns and the murder comes in, that, uh, and this is probably my major contribution to historical psychiatry would be this methodological contribution rather than all the that uh, in 1978, when I was in law school, Lexus came out with their legal database of legal, historical legal cases. And as soon as I heard about this, I thought, well, this is great. I, I'm going to try searching legal terms and see if it can tell me the earliest usage of the term, compare that with the OMP. So uh, I did that, and uh, uh, the first term I used was uh, mootness, M-O-O-T-N-E-S-S. The OED in 1946 as their first use of mootness, but Lexus pulled up a 1940 case. Um, subsequently, the older cases that use it. But, so that, I think, had to have been the, the earliest use of uh, full text searchable online databases for historical lexicography, because Nexus, uh, the non-legal version of Lexus, was the first database that most people would have, would have even been aware of. Nexus didn't even exist at the time I did this, so I think it was probably the earliest such research. Uh, so then I, so I, I, I searched various other legal terms after that, uh, and one example was uh, politically correct, uh, which the OED had, 1936 was their earliest use for it, but uh, Lexus pulled up a 1792 case that used the, the uh, words politically correct. Now, of course, it wasn't quite the modern meaning, but it was actually surprisingly close to the modern meaning, talking about appointing linguistic editing. Uh, then, a bit, a bit later, I tried searching uh, terms like motherfucking uh, in Lexus, and I was surprised to find, and this is Jesse's kind of territory, but I was surprised to find I could find much earlier uses of some of these terms in legal cases. Uh, you would think legal cases would be the last place to, to find that kind of, of uh, demotic vocabulary. But what it was was the, the Texas uh, courts were amazingly uh, uninhibited in the words that they would print. Uh, and uh, in the 18th, uh, the term motherfucking, the OED's first use was at that time, it was uh, 1959 from Norman Mailer, I believe. But in Le Lexus pulled up an 1889 Texas case. They used the term motherfucker. How did they use it? Well, some cowboy shot some other cowboy to death. And his defense at the trial was, well, that guy called me a goddamn lying, horse thieving, motherfucking son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, so you can see there how it can get into a legal case. Did he get off? Well, you know, someone just asked me that the other day. I don't remember. Yes. Yeah. In fact, the judge, yeah. Yeah, the judge specifically said that you know, if you find that the deceased called the defendant a motherfucking son of a bitch, then you can't find the accused guilty of anything worse than manslaughter right. if you find him guilty of anything at all. There you go. There you go. There you go. Manslaughter again. Yeah. <laughs> Similar with cocksucking, the you know, OED's first use was 1923, I think, from E. Cummings. Uh, but it appeared in a 1902 Texas case, very similar kind of uh, murder case. Uh, so th these were things that I got from Lexus, the legal database. And then uh, what happened uh, some years later was there started to be a second wave of historical text collections coming online that you can search. Early English books online, 18th century collections online, Pearl Quest historical newspapers, uh, America's historical newspapers, newspapers.com, British newspapers, 1600 to 1950. And these revolutionized historical lexicography, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I went to Oxford, I think, in the uh, 
around the year 2000, uh, and I uh, met with John Simpson, the editor in chief, and he showed me that he had his, uh, his favorites on, on Netscape, uh, favorites that were bookmarked on his computer were exactly the same databases that I had on my computer. So they were using these databases, and they got uh, very good, I think, at using these databases. And now, uh, if I find an antidote now, it's uh, almost always online. In the old days, uh, a contributor to the OED would haunt the stacks of large libraries, very large libraries, uh, with lots of old books, and browse looking for, for interesting word uses. And then I did that, uh, originally I did that at the Harvard Library and then at the New York Public Library. I did some in, uh, I was in Washington, I used to work with Congress, and then and, at uh, Yale. Uh, I used to Yale at or some of them, by the time I was at Yale, I really was coming uh, to every day yet, but sometime I transferred my methodology to searching these databases. Uh, and it's completely trans, uh, the OED. Uh, if I find an antidote by certain databases, the chances are very good the OED would find exactly the same antidote, uh, if not now at some later stage. So it actually is less gratifying than it used to be. In the old days, <laughs> you felt it was your own talents, your own ability to open a book at the right page that led to the antidote. And now it's, it's more the talents of the database than uh, yourself. I mean, I, you might be able, you might have access to some databases the OD doesn't. You might uh, you know, think of ways of searching that they don't. But uh, it's not really such a discovery if the OED would inevitably have discovered it at some later point. The exact same thing. Uh, but uh, I mean, that, that's what antidote is nowadays. In, in, in law, there are databases also beyond Lexis and Westlaw. Uh, there is. Uh, for example, Pine Online, which is, uh, has virtually all legal periodicals from uh, the English language, uh, or you can search them. Uh, Making a Modern Law has, and this one that particularly glad that I created it more or less, that working with the Kale Company, I, I planned it and implemented it to a large extent. Uh, this has legal treatises, monographs about law. 1800 to 1926, uh, and pretty much with all the English language uh, monographs are, are in there from, from the law. Uh, now, in addition to the OED, I get, I'm not out of time. No, victory. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in addition to the OED, I, I do other kinds of lexicography of this sort. Black's Law Dictionary. Uh, the past few editions, Brian Garner, the editor of Black's Law Dictionary, who now I guess will carry the torch for his career. He was still his collaborator of two books. Uh, he engaged me to supply dates of first use for all of the <coughs> terms of Black's Law Dictionary. It's 30,000 terms. And, uh, I, I did this last few editions and uh, I consciously spent about 30 <coughs> seconds to one minute on each term because I calculated that if I took longer than that I would be making about $4 per hour. <laughs> <laughs>
helped by the fact that in the law, if you cite something, you're expected to give a precise citation. So that helps very much in the research. Um, and I then got the idea to do a general quotation dictionary uh, and a you know, book of quotations. And I essentially used database searching for that as well, although they, all these resources weren't yet available when I was doing that. I'm now working in the second edition of just drowned in information because there's so much great, uh, so many great resources out there for quotation research. Uh, I'll just give one example of a quotation and I'll tell you uh, and then ask the questions. Uh, to show you how much the databases have transformed our, our ability to understand quotation origins, uh, a legal quotation, justice delayed is justice denied. The Oxford Dictionary of Quotations, a very good, highly respected quotation dictionary, says that justice delayed is justice denied is a late 20th century saying. Now probably all of you remember, can remember hearing it uh, you know, some time ago, and how old you are you really remember it before the late 20th century. And that's just ridiculous. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Proverbs, which gives OED-like citations and tries to you know, give you the earliest example that they have. Uh, they, their first use for justice delay is justice denied it's from the Nairobi Daily Nation in 1999. Uh, if you search newspaper databases, you quickly see that uh, William Gladstone, the Prime Minister William Gladstone, in 1868, gave a very important speech to Parliament about Ireland in which he used the phrase justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, and uh, even earlier, there's a database called Save in Americana, which had, pulls up an 1842 article in the Louisiana Law Journal using justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, I have a, a column, a regular column in the Yale Alumni Magazine about quotations. When I wrote about this, uh, Justice Delayed is Justice Denied in my column. Someone named Edward Conklin wrote, emailed me and said that he, by using Google Books, he had found an 1815 book, 1815 book, uh, that had Justice Delayed is little better than Justice Denied. And he found a 1646 book had the title, Another Word to the Wise, showing that delay of justice is great injustice. With quotations, you're not just looking for the exact word or similar quotations. Um, I should open it up for some questions at this point. Uh, in the back, yeah, I just wanted to say that because ec the text bases of echo and ego were constructed by machine read. Um, microfilm and the microfilm is itself partial there is what I call the myth of comprehensiveness so people actually believe everything is in there and fortunately volunteers are adding to it and also correcting the OCR but there's still a lot of room for serendipity yeah. you, you know for people actually to go to real books and find things and recognize pattern recognition yes thank you guys for coming Um, I don't know, what, what was the date that you gave for Lexis? For when I did the Lexis? Yeah. In 1978. Okay, because the, the uh, Thais de la Langue Française came out in 1971. Um, yeah. it, was, it was a project that I, I worked on, the, uh, yeah. putting it online later in the 90s. But uh, that, um, that was based on a corpus compiled, a, a historical corpus compiled in, on punch cards and paper papers. Okay, okay. Well, here and, uh, I should have come to this meeting now, but I'm going to finish that. Just going to tie what you're saying to Larry's topic is that Google Books is an also is an incredible resource for the kind of research that, that is going to be discussed in Brigham Young. Um, you know, there's a ton of stuff there from around the time of the founding, much more than is available on Koha or is going to be available on this one. And, I've, I've been researching the, the rule of the last antecedent, which is a rule of statutory interpretation, which some people think was made up in the late 19th century by a 
I wrote a statutory interpretation treatise, which actually goes back, I've gotten back in the 15th century in the English yearbooks, the Latin phrase, ad proximum antecedens fria relatio. And, you know, I can't go farther back than this, like, 14-something or other, and I don't know how to go farther back than that, because I, that stuff, you know, is not published. You know, that was before the printing press. So, oh, so, I don't know where that stuff's going to be online, but it's got to go back probably hundreds of years before that. The uh, English statutes are, are not in a facsimile. Right, but this is, the, this is not the statutes. This is the yearbook, for, you know, it's, it's in, in, in law French, and it's from, you know, it's, it's farther back than I think the database of English cases and the regular database. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a Boston College has a there's a guy here who specialized in as opposed to being David Yeah, and I think he has yearbooks online, but I'm not sure if it's full text. So, did you search lapses for two Did you search lapses for two Um. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what those cowboys were arguing about, actually. That's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's the great oh, um, I'm wondering if you ever use uh, courtlistener.com or um, justsee.com, and if you're familiar with them at all, and how you think they compare to Westlaw and Lexis. What were they names? Courtlistener.com. And uh, justia.com. I think there's oh, one. Oh, yeah, justia.com. Sure. No, I've heard of the second one, but yeah. I haven't used other ones. Oh, there are legal searches. But they're public. They're public. Yeah, yeah. Right. Without uh, subscription. Right. I've got good news for you because I'm an archivist. And so in archives, we deal normally with uh, unique records. And most unique records, you know, before the 20th century were handwritten. So, I mean, there aren't many printed records and mostly books. And so, almost none of that, you can't OCR that stuff, ICR won't work on that stuff. The, the hands change all the time, so there's plenty of stuff for you to read. But you have to either find it online in some digital form to read, or you're gonna have to go to the places for it. But there's, there's thousands of antedatings in there. The, the only one I ever sent to the OED was one that I read in a, a letter from the 1700s in New York State. Where are you Really, I'm the chief records officer now for the New York State Unified Court System. I used to work for the New York State Archives. So. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, there, there are always uh, very obscure sources that are not going to be digitized and manuscript sources. Uh, the, the word soccer uh, has been pushed back secondary school newspapers in England in the 1880s uh, because they happened to, some of them happened to be on Google Books. I'm sure there's lots of other of these school <coughs> newspapers that haven't been uh, put on Google Books that they have early. And for great text of, of human speech, go to um, transcripts of divorce uh, proceedings, especially for very rich people. They'll be bound uh, they'll go on for hundreds of pages, and they have detailed, detailed, you know, uh, testimony, because you had to give testimony that was really damning to prove something in New York State. And amazing detail, and you can hear people's voices because they're so exact. 